If a man dies, shall he live again? What does it mean to be absent from the body and present with the Lord? Did Jesus go with a thief to paradise on Good Friday? Did the souls of dead people really cry out from below the altar? Pastor Bohr answers these questions and more in the amazing series Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father and our God, we're so thankful for the awesome opportunity of coming into your presence with the express purpose of opening your holy book and studying a portion from that book. We ask, Father, that as we explore Philippians chapter 1 and verses 21 to 24, that your Holy Spirit will be with us, open our minds that we might be able to uh, understand what you have for us. Help us to set aside all preconceived ideas that we might hear your voice. We pray this in the precious name of your beloved Son, Jesus. Amen. As I mentioned in my prayer, we're going to study today the passage that we find in the book of Philippians, chapter 1 and verses 21 to 24. And basically, in this series, we're dealing with texts that have been misused to try and teach that when a person dies, their soul departs the body and goes to heaven if the person was righteous, or perhaps to hell if the person was wicked. We're dealing with the texts that are used to try and prove that. We're not trying to sweep these Bible verses under the rug. Uh, you know, it's very easy to use verses that uh, express our own ideas, like the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. You know, the Bible is clear on that. But then you have these difficult verses that you have to deal with. You have to come to terms with them. And so today we are going to discuss another one of these passages. Turn in your Bibles with me then to Philippians chapter 1 and verses 21 to 24, and in a couple of moments I'm going to go uh, back to verse 20 as well for the context. It says there, here the Apostle Paul is speaking, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in, on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So basically, the idea that people get from this passage, uh, as they read it with their preconceived notions, is that the Apostle Paul was very anxious to die and depart at the moment of his death so that he could be with Christ. That is, so that his soul could be with Christ. The question is, is this what the passage is really trying to teach? And of course, as we examine it, we will notice that it is not teaching this at all. Now I need to give you a little bit of historical context about the book of Philippians. This book was written by the Apostle Paul during his first imprisonment in the Mamertine prison in Rome. Now at this point the Apostle Paul did not know yet whether he was going to be delivered from prison or whether he was going to die the death of a martyr. So he didn't really know what was going to occur, whether he was going to die or whether he was going to be released and live, or whether he was going to be left in prison indefinitely. Now you say, how do we know that this book was written uh, while the Apostle Paul was in prison? Well, let's notice several verses from chapter 1 of Philippians, and we'll read verse 7, and then we'll go to verses 13 and 14. And I want you to notice the terminology. The Apostle Paul is in prison at this point. He says this, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both, notice this, in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, 
you all are partakers with me of grace. That's verse 7. Now let's go to verse 13. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard, see they're speaking about the guards at the prison, the whole palace guard, and to all the rest, that my chains, there's the idea of chains again, that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by, here it is again, my chains are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So very clearly in context the Apostle Paul is writing this epistle from prison and according to those who have studied the chronology of the Gospels and the chronology of the books of the Apostle Paul they say that this is the first imprisonment of Paul in Rome. Now I'd like us to go back one verse, we started at verse 21 but let's go to verse 20 and notice a very interesting and important expression here. It says in Philippians 1 verse 20, here the Apostle Paul once again is speaking, according to my earnest expectation, I want you to remember that expression, earnest expectation. By the way, that's the translation of one Greek word. The Greek word is apokaradokia. That's a long word, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Basically that word is translated earnest expectation, and now notice, according to my earnest expectation and what? Hope. Notice that Paul had an earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. What does the Apostle Paul want? He wants to magnify Jesus in his body, whether it be alive or whether it be what? Dead. And you'll notice that he has an earnest expectation and hope. Now the question is, what was the earnest expectation and hope of the Apostle Paul? Was his earnest and expectation and hope uh, that of dying and having his soul depart from the body and go to heaven to be with Jesus? Was that his earnest expectation and hope? Absolutely not. You see we need to let Paul interpret Paul. So now we need to go to Romans chapter 8 and verses 19 to 23 where the Apostle Paul uses that very same Greek word, apokaradokia. Romans 8, 19 through 23. Here the Apostle Paul says this, For the earnest expectation, there's the same word, the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. You see, creation is eagerly waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. What does that mean? Verse 20, For the creation was subject to, subjected to futility, not willingly. That is because Adam sinned, nature fell into futility, but it wasn't the choice of nature. And so it says, once again verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in what? Hope. So is there hope for creation? Yes there is. Does creation have an earnest expectation? it most certainly does. Verse 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Is nature going to be transformed according to this? At the same time that the children of God are transformed. Absolutely. And that's the earnest expectation of the children of God and of creation or nature. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. And what are we groaning about? We're groaning so we can die and have our soul fly off to be with the Lord, right? Absolutely not. It says once again verse 23, not only that, but we also have, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, 
eagerly waiting for the adoption. And what is the adoption? The redemption of our what? The redemption of our body. So what was Paul's earnest expectation? Was it to die and have his soul go to heaven? No. It was, according to this, the adoption, the redemption of the body. And when does the redemption of the body take place? The Apostle Paul makes it very clear that our body will be redeemed from corruption to incorruption, from mortality to immortality when Jesus comes on the clouds of heaven. Now you'll notice here that the Apostle Paul says that he wants to uh, magnify in his body Jesus whether it be by life or by death. By the way, that word magnify is also translated glorify God either by life or by death. Now the question is, how could the Apostle Paul glorify God by his death? You say, that doesn't make any sense. How can you glorify God by your death? The fact is that you can if you are going to die the death of a martyr. Notice the parallel case of the other great apostle of the early church the Apostle Peter. Go to John 21 and verses 18 and 19. John chapter 21 and verses 18 and 19. You know Jesus here was talking about what was going to happen to Simon Peter at the end of his life. Jesus was saying your arms are going to be extended and you're not going to have any control whatsoever over your body. In other words they are going to extend your arms and they're going to crucify you. Notice John 21 verses 18 and 19. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. And by the way, early church tradition says the Apostle Peter was offered the option of being crucified uh, with his head up like Jesus was but he chose that he could not die in the same manner as his master and so he requested that they crucify him with his head down. Notice verse 19. This he spoke signifying by what death he would what? Glorify God. And when he had spoken this he said to him follow me. What is it that the death of Peter did? it glorified God or it magnified God because Peter was dying a faithful martyr to Jesus. By the way we have another case in scripture of a death of a great saint glorifying God. Notice Acts chapter 7 and verses 59 and 60. Acts chapter 7 and verses 59 and 60. This is speaking about the death of Stephen the first Christian martyr. And it says there in verse 59, And they stoned Stephen, as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Let me ask you, did the death of Stephen bring glory and honor to God? It most certainly did. And we're going to notice that it also bore fruit to the glory of God. You say, what do you mean it bore fruit to the glory of God? Do you know that according to the book Acts of the Apostles, when Saul of Tarsus was watching those people stone Stephen, and he saw Stephen with such a peaceful look on his face, and looking to heaven, and, and speaking to Jesus at the right hand of God, Saul of Tarsus was greatly impacted and he knew that Stephen had something that he needed. Of course, in reaction to quiet his conscience, he immediately went to persecute the church to Damascus. But you know what happened? He was knocked to the ground, a voice spoke to him, and to make a long story short, Saul of Tarsus became the great Apostle Paul. It all began when the stoning of Stephen was taking place and the Bible says in Acts chapter 6 and verse 15 that the face of Stephen was like the face of an angel. And so 
what is the Apostle Paul saying? He's saying, if I die the death of a martyr, because he knew he was going to die the death of a martyr, he says, my death will what? My death will bring glory and honor to God. My death will magnify the Lord. Now notice what the Apostle Paul continues saying in Philippians 1 and verse 21. He says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now you say, now wait a minute. How can the Apostle Paul say that to die is gain? We can understand that to live uh, for Christ, you know, that is a blessing. But in what sense is the Apostle Paul um, gaining by dying? Well, the fact is that the Apostle Paul at this period in his ministry was very, very tired. In fact, I want to read you what the Apostle Paul had gone through at this point of his life. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 23 to 28. This was quite an experience of the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28. Here the Apostle Paul is describing the many trials of his life. Are they ministers of Christ? He's speaking about his accusers. I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, and then notice he says, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Would you say that the Apostle Paul at this point was pretty tired? <laughs> After going through all of these experiences, the Apostle Paul is worn out. So he's saying, you know, for me, actually to die would be what? Would be gain. Why would it be gain? Notice Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. You see, in death, what happens? The Bible uniformly says that at the moment of death, we go to sleep. We just read it in Acts chapter 7 and verse 60 about Stephen. It says there that when he was stoned, he fell asleep. Let me ask you, is sleep an enjoyable experience? Do you rest from your daily labors? Absolutely. Now notice what it says in Revelation 14 verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So what happens with people when they die? They go and they what? And they rest. Even today we say, the person was laid to what? the person was laid to rest. We don't mean that the body was laid to rest, we mean that the total person was laid to rest. And so the Apostle Paul is saying, you know, for me to die that would be gain, because I would, I would rest. Did the Apostle Paul have the security that if he died, he was dying in Christ and he would resurrect someday? He knew that it was just a moment of unconsciousness. And so he knew that if he died, the next thing he was going to hear was the voice of Jesus. So he says, if I could rest from my labors, if I could just pass away, that would be gain, because I wouldn't have to suffer and go through these tribulations anymore. Are you understanding what the Apostle Paul is saying? But then the Apostle Paul says something else. Notice verse 22. But if I live on in the flesh, that is if I don't die, to die would be gain, he says. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Now we need to ask the question, what does the Apostle Paul mean when he says, 
if I live on in the flesh. You know, some people take that and say, see, the Apostle Paul was saying that he didn't want to live in the flesh anymore. He wanted to live as a disincarnated spirit or soul in the presence of the Lord. What did the Apostle Paul mean when he said to live in the flesh? What he's actually saying is that if I live in my present body, in my present existence, in a world where my body is corruptible and mortal, Let's notice several other texts from the Bible that use this expression flesh or flesh and blood. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. It says there, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Let me ask you, does that mean that in the kingdom of God we're not going to have flesh and blood? Does that mean that we're going to have some just kind of some ghostly existence with no flesh and blood at all? Of course not. When it says flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, that phrase is explained in the next phrase. It says, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. So what does flesh and blood mean? It means our body in its present state of what? of corruption. It's not talking about living in a spirit existence outside the body. When, it, when the Apostle Paul st says to live in the flesh with flesh and blood, he's saying to stay in this body which is mortal and corruptible is better right now because it will bear fruit. We'll talk about the fruit in a few moments. By the way, when God's people resurrect, are they going to have a body? A real body? Yes. What kind of body? Well, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and let's start at verse 51. We're already there. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of, of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised. How? Incorruptible. And we shall be changed. Now notice this. For this corruptible that is this flesh that we have now, this corruptible must put on what? Incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? So let me ask you, are we going to have a body in the kingdom come? Yes, we are. What kind of body? Immortal and incorruptible. But now we are in the flesh. We have flesh and blood, which means our present existence, our corruptible, mortal body. It's not that we now have a body and then we're not going to have a body. It means that now our body is corruptible and mortal, then our body will be immortal and incorruptible. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, let's look at another text that speaks about being in the flesh. Notice Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. By the way, while you're looking for Hebrews 5 verse 7, let me ask you this question. Do you believe that Jesus today has a body? Do you all believe He has a body? Does that body have bones and, and blood? Yes? Absolutely. We're going to notice it in a minute. But now notice the expression that is used about Jesus while He lived in this earth in a body that was subject to death and subject to weakness and subject to suffering. Notice Hebrews 5 verse 7. Who in the days of His flesh so now He doesn't have flesh, right? Of course He does. Is it a different kind of flesh? Yes, because His flesh now is what? Incorruptible and immortal. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Notice also Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. It says there, Inasmuch then as the children, that's us, have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. So did Jesus have flesh and blood like we have flesh and blood? Yes. Was he subject to death at that point? Of course, because he did die. And so it says, that through death 
he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So Jesus had flesh and blood. Question, did Jesus still have flesh and blood and bones after his resurrection? Of course he did. So when Jesus came forth from the grave, was he some kind of ghost or some kind of soul or spirit entity? Of course not. Notice what we find in Luke 24 and verse 39. Luke 24, 39. This is after the resurrection. Jesus says to his disciples, Behold my hands and my feet. Did Jesus have hands and feet? So did he have a body? Of course he did. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have what? Flesh and bones as you see that I have. So did, does Jesus have flesh and bones today? Of course He does. What is the distinction then? The distinction is in the days of the flesh simply does not mean contrasting the flesh with the spirit or the soul, it's contrasting our present existence of corruptibility and mortality with our future existence of immortality and incorruptibility. Now, notice 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44, that puts it all together. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 to 44. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. I'd like to read a very interesting statement from Ellen White, the book Maranatha, which is a devotional book, page 301, where she speaks about the spiritual body and its relationship to the physical body. She says, Paul illustrates this subject the subject of the verses that we just read. Paul illustrates this subject by the kernel of grain sown in the field. The planted kernel decays, but there comes forth a new kernel. Is this true, those of you who are into agriculture? Sure. The natural substance of the grain that decays is never raised as before. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased Him. A much finer material will compose the human body. For it is a new creation, a new birth. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now why does the Apostle Paul say, but if I live in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. In other words, if I live in this present existence, if this will produce fruit. What did he mean by fruit? Well, let's go to Colossians chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6. Let's allow Paul interpret, to interpret Paul. Colossians 1 verses 5 and 6. Here the Apostle Paul says, Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. So he's talking about the preaching of the gospel which has come to you, as it has also into all the world, and is bringing forth what? Fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. So how was the preaching of the gospel bearing fruit? It was bearing fruit because souls were being won to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Notice also John 12 and verse 24 on what the Apostle Paul means that if I live in the flesh, in other words, if I live in my present existence, in my corruptible mortal body, I'll be able to preach the gospel and people will come to the feet of Jesus and be saved. John chapter 12 verse 24 speaks about uh, some Greeks that come to Jesus and they want Jesus to come and preach over in Greece. And Jesus says something strange. He says, you know, it's not time to go to Greece now. The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The time has come for me to die, is what he's saying. Notice John 12, verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, 
unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and what? and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies it produces much what? much fruit or much grain. And of course that's talking about souls that are saved. So the Apostle Paul is very clearly saying that to live in the flesh in his present existence will allow him to preach the gospel and as a result he will have the fruit of souls coming to the feet of Jesus. So he says, if I live in the flesh I'm going to bring souls and fruit to Jesus. If I die, he says, God will be glorified and he will be what? And he will be magnified. So now he says, I don't know which of the two, which of the two options I should choose. Notice Philippians chapter 1 and verses 22 and 23. See the Apostle Paul is caught between a rock and a hard place. He says, you know, for me to die would be gain because you know I would magnify and glorify God by the death of a martyr and I would rest from all of my trials and tribulations and labors. He says, but if I live in the flesh in my present existence I can preach the gospel and I can bear fruit. So he says, now I don't know what to choose. I don't know whether to live in the flesh or I don't really know whether it would be better to die and to rest. He, up till this point he has how many options? Two options. But now suddenly a third option is going to appear and you say, what is the third option? Philippians 1, 22 and 23. It says, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. He says, whether to live in the flesh or whether it is to die, I can't tell. For I am hard, hard pressed, in other words I'm torn between the two, that is dying or staying. Having a desire to depart, now notice here comes a third option. He says, I don't know what to choose whether to live in the flesh or, or whether to die. He says, but now a third option comes. He says, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Departing and being with Christ is far better than what? It is far better than living in the flesh. It is far better than what? Than dying. Now the question is, when did the Apostle Paul expect this moment to be when he would de depart and be with Christ which would be far better. Was it that he would die and at that moment he would depart to be with Jesus? Of course not. Because he says, I don't know whether to choose death or life. I don't know whether to live in the flesh or I don't know whether it would be good to rest from my labors. He says, but there's something that's better than either of those. And that is to depart and to be with whom? and to be with Jesus, which would be far better, far better than what? than living in the flesh, far better than simply dying. In other words the Apostle Paul is presenting a third option, he's saying translation is better than living in the flesh, translation is better than simply dying. In other words I would love to be translated to heaven from what? from among the living. By the way does this text tell us when he expected to depart? Does the text say, um, you know Christians read it this way, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell for I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart the moment I die and be with Christ which is far better. That's the way Christians read it. See they add to the verse. They, they say, oh I, I want to depart, I want to die and I want to depart. By the way, does it say here, I would love to die and have my soul depart to be with Christ? No, these are assumptions that are added by Christians because they're reading their preconceived notions into Scripture. They're reading Greek philosophy into the Bible instead of allowing the Bible to speak for itself. Now the question is, when did the Apostle Paul expect to be with Jesus? Should we let Paul tell us? Was that at the moment of death? Absolutely not. Go with me to Philippians 3 verses 10 and 11. By the way it's the same book. Do you think the Apostle Paul in chapter 3 would contradict what he said in chapter 1? Of course not. When did the Apostle Paul expect to be with Jesus? What did he look forward to if he should die? Was he looking forward to his soul flying off to heaven? Or was he looking forward to the resurrection of the dead? Notice 
Philippians 3, 10 and 11. That I may know Him, that is Jesus, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, notice, being conformed to His death, that my soul can fly off to heaven when I die. That's not what it says. Being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to my immortal soul going to heaven. That's not what it says. It says that I may attain to the what? To the resurrection of the dead. What was the hope of the Apostle Paul? It was not dying and having his soul go to heaven. It was dying and then having Jesus resurrect him from the dead. The very book of Philippians tells us that. Now also notice 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. And here we're going to deal with another problem that Christians bring to the fore. They misread this text uh, to give the idea, and I'll tell you what the idea is. It's the idea that when a person dies, listen to this, the body goes to the grave, the soul flies off to heaven to be with Jesus, and then when Jesus comes back the second time, he brings with him all of the souls of those who went to heaven when they died, and all those souls now are joined with the body, and then Jesus takes the soul and the body together back to heaven. Is that really what Jesus was trying to teach? Is that what the Apostle Paul was even trying to teach? Of course not. But let's read this problematic passage, and then I'm going to give you a simple explanation of what Scripture is telling us. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Who are those who have fallen asleep? Those who have what? Those who have died. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Now here comes the, the verse. For if we believe that Jesus died, and what? Rose again. Where did Jesus go after he rose again? He went to heaven, right? He went to his father's house. Would you agree with that? He died. He resurrected. And he was taken by the angels to where? To his father's house. To the presence of his father. Very clearly. We're going to notice that in a moment. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Now notice. Even so. What does even so mean? Just like this, in the same way, even so, God, is this God the Father or Jesus? This is God the Father. God will bring, who's going to bring? God is going to bring, not Jesus. God will bring with whom? God will bring with Jesus to where? To heaven, to where the Father is. That's right. It says, once again, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God, God the Father, will bring, that is to heaven, with Him, that is with Jesus, those who what? Those who sleep in Jesus. Now you say, now is this really true? That it's not speaking about Jesus bringing anybody with Him, but it's speaking about Jesus taking those people from earth with Him to God, to the Father in heaven? Absolutely. The context makes it very, very clear. Let's notice a few details before we read the succeeding verses. John 8 verse 29 tells us that the Father sent Jesus to this world. Notice John 8 verse 29. And this is just uh, rudimentary. This is elementary. But we need to have it in order to understand this passage. It says here in John 8, 29, And he who sent me is with me. Who is the one who sent Jesus? God the Father. He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please Him. So let me ask you, did the Father come down with Jesus, or did the Father send Jesus? Did the Father stay in heaven when He sent Jesus the first time? Of course. He stayed up there, and He sent Jesus. Now, notice John 16, verse 28, where this idea is corroborated. John 16, and verse 28. Jesus says, I came forth from where? From the Father. In other words, He was sent to the, by the Father, and have come where? 
into the world. And then he says again, I leave the world and what? Go to the Father. Where was the Father all the while Jesus was on earth? The Father was in heaven. That's why he taught us to pray, Our Father which art everywhere. No. He taught us to pray, Our Father which art where? which are in heaven. So are you understanding this? That the Father stayed in heaven, He sent Jesus, and then Jesus died, He resurrected, and He what? He came back to His Father. Brought by whom? By the angels. Thank you. Now notice Revelation 12 verse 5. Revelation chapter 12 verse 5. In case you don't believe that Jesus was caught up by God to God's throne, it's very clear here. It says in Revelation 12 verse 5, speaking about uh, she who bore Jesus, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to God and to His throne. So where was Jesus caught up to? After He died and resurrected? To the Father's throne. So notice the sequence. Jesus was sent by the Father, the Father stayed in heaven, Jesus came, He died, He resurrected, and then He was brought by the angels back to the Father's throne, and He sat next to His Father on the throne. Is that sequence clear? Now let me ask you this. When Jesus comes to this world a second time, is the Father coming with Him? No. You say, no? No. Just like the first time, the Father is going to be in heaven. I'm going to prove it to you in a moment from Scripture. In other words, the Father is going to stay in heaven, and He's going to send Jesus with all of His what? With all of His holy angels. And somebody says, but Pastor Boer, what about that text that says that Jesus will come in the glory of His Father? Well, the fact is that Jesus is always in the glory of His Father. Notice Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. It says that Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory, the express image of His person. So Jesus always bears the glory of His Father. Coming in the glory of His Father is different than saying that He comes with His Father. Are you with me or not? Now let's read a very interesting text. Acts chapter 3 verses 19 and 20. Acts chapter 3 verses 19 and 20. Here Peter is speaking after the day of Pentecost, and he says this, Repent therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. I won't go into that right now. That's, talking, that's not talking about when, forgiveness. Because the apostle Peter has already talked about forgiveness or remission of sins. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, forgiveness of sins. Blotting out of sins is different, but I won't get into that. Repent therefore be in, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, now notice this, so that times of refreshing, that's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain, and so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, who is that Lord that is spoken of there? From the presence of the Lord, that's God the Father, because it continues saying, from the presence of the Lord, and that he may shall or may in the New King James so that he shall or he may what? Send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before. Is the Father going to send Jesus? Yes. So if he sends Jesus, he is not coming with Jesus. Now you say, Pastor, why do you go through all of this detour? It's not a detour. It's background to understanding these verses in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. Now let me just put it succinctly and simply. Jesus was sent by the Father to this earth. He died. He resurrected. He was caught up by the angels and taken back to the Father's throne. Is that the same thing that's going to happen with those who died and resurrect? Remember, even so, the Apostle Paul says, even so will happen with God's people. You see, God's people also will die, and they will what? And they will resurrect, 
And who will be sent from heaven? Jesus along with what? All of the holy angels and God's people will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and there, then where will God's people be taken to? They will be taken to the Father's house. So let me ask you, is the Father bringing with Jesus all of those who went to sleep? Of course He is. But you see, it's not Jesus bringing the sleeping saints down, it is Jesus bringing the sleeping saints up. Are you with me? I hope so. I see some of you with a puzzled look. I don't know how I can make it any clearer. Do you want me to repeat it again? Not necessary? No? Yes? No? Maybe? No, it's clear. Now you say, Pastor, is your interpretation really correct? Well, let's continue reading the verses that come afterwards. It's absolutely clear that this is not talking about Jesus bringing with him. It doesn't say that Jesus will bring with him. It says that God will bring with Jesus to where he is. Notice 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Who goes to heaven first? Those who went to sleep, those who died, or those who are alive when Jesus comes? Who goes to heaven first? Neither one of them goes first. So much for the idea that when the dead died, they went to be with the Lord. Because the Apostle Paul says, no, they didn't. They go together with those who are alive when Jesus comes. Notice verse 16. For the Lord Himself will what? Descend from heaven. Is He coming again? What's He coming for the second time? Ah, He's coming to pick up His people and bring them with Him where? To the Father's house. So it says, for the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first now notice the dead in Christ will rise first then we who are alive and remain how many groups? two groups who are alive and remain shall be what? caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so he comes down, and we go what? And we go up, and we meet him in the air, and then what happens after we meet him in the air? We go further up to the Father's house. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, that is in the Father's house, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, that is in the Father's house, that the where I am, there ye may be what? There ye may be also. So this text is not saying at all what Christians think it's saying. You see, they don't read carefully what Scripture is saying. They don't read the context. They just interpret Scripture in the light of the traditions that they have received repeatedly over and over again. They do it with the story of the rich man and Lazarus. They say, yes, he went immediately after death, uh, and, and he was talking down there when he was burning. Interesting. They say the thief on the cross, that very day he went with Jesus to paradise. We notice that Jesus did not go to paradise that very day. He went to the grave. The thief didn't go to paradise either because he, was, because he wasn't dead. And then people say, well, but what about the witch of Endor? You know, didn't the witch of Endor uh, bring Samuel before Saul? We studied. No, there's no way when you look at the story. That good Samuel, who by the way is going to live again at the resurrection according to Hebrews chapter 11, would appear to wicked Saul and say, Hey Saul, tomorrow you're going to be in the same place where I'm at. Be real. When we read that story, how can we come to conclusions like that? Trouble is, we trust our religious teachers. We accept that as gospel truth. But God is not going to ask us, what did your pastor believe? What did your priest believe? He's going to say, did you have a Bible and did you read it? Did you study it? He's not going to accept any excuses from us. 
saying, oh no, my pastor told me, or my priest told me. Jesus is going to say, did you have a Bible, yes or no? There'll be no excuse in that day. The uniform concept of the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to mention three passages. We've looked at two of them, and in our next lecture, we're going to look at the third I'll go through this quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul speaks about three options. Being alive, being naked, we'll deal with this in our next lecture, which means being dead, and in the third place, being translated. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul also speaks of us being alive, going to sleep, and being translated. In Philippians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, living in the flesh is more productive of fruit because I can preach the gospel. He says, but if I die, I know that I will go to heaven, but it would be much better if I could be what? If I could be translated. Now let's go to one last passage before we finish this study. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. The Apostle Paul is in the Mamertine prison for the second time. This is his second and last imprisonment. He's about to be beheaded. I want you to notice here, when it is that the Apostle Paul expected to receive his crown. It's not at the moment of death that he expected to receive his reward. It was, it will be at the moment when Jesus comes. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. Here the Apostle Paul says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. He's talking about his departure from the land of the living. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me, in other words, there is stored up for me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me immediately after my death. No, that's not what it says. That what's, that's the way that Christians interpret it. It says, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. What day is that? On that day. The day when Jesus comes. That's right. On that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have believed His appearing. Mm -mm. All those who have taught His appearing. All those who have preached His appearing. Uh-uh. It's not enough to believe it, or to teach it, or to preach it. The Apostle Paul says that there is a crown prepared for all those who have what? Who have loved His appearing. When is it that Jesus is going to give the crown to those who have overcome? It is not at the moment of death that we receive our reward. It's not at the moment of death that Jesus receives us into glory. It is on that day when Jesus gives the crown to Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, that he will give that crown to everyone who has received Jesus as Savior and Lord. This is the glorious hope of the church, folks. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Oh, what a beautiful promise. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And then in the very next verse, the Apostle John says, Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself even as He is pure. You see, by contemplating Jesus, every day we become like Him. Beholding as in a mirror without a veil the glory of the Lord, 
we are being changed from glory to glory into the same likeness. And it's not at the moment of death that we're going to be with Him. At death we go to the grave, we sleep, we rest. But the next wakeful moment, the next instant, we will hear the voice of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, calling us from the grave. And when we wake up, if we should die before Jesus comes, it will be like no time has passed from the time we died till our next thinking moment. So there is a certain sense in which the moment a person dies, at the very next moment they're going to be with the Lord. We know that there's a period that transpires between death and the moment of the resurrection, but the dead person doesn't know. You see, for the dead person he dies now, and his next thinking moment is hearing the voice of Jesus. There was no separation for the person who was dead. Isn't that a marvelous thought? That there is no separation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But then the Apostle Paul ends this passage by <laughs> expressing these words. See, he, he, he loved people. He loved souls. And so he says, you know, to die would be gain. To live in the flesh would bear fruit. To be translated would be far better. But then he says in verse 24, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh, that is to remain in my corruptible, mortal body is more needful for you. How unselfish. He says, you know, I'd love to depart and be with the Lord. To die would be gain. I would rest from my labors. And Jesus then would call to call, come to call me forth from the grave. But he says, it's really more necessary for your sake for me to remain because I still have to preach the gospel. I still have to proclaim the message to the world. I still have to harvest much fruit for the Lord as a result of preaching the gospel. So the Apostle Paul says, though to die would be gain, though to be translated would be far better, to stay in the flesh in my present existence is more needful to you. And we know that the Apostle Paul died he produced much fruit. His crown will have many stars. The question is, are we so close to Jesus that when His voice calls, we shall also hear His voice and go to live with Him forever?